Cabin Sports Radio. Here comes the siren. I want to go higher. Oh, my goodness. Cabin Sports Radio, the final episode of 2018. Possibly. Still deciding whether I want to do a New Year's Eve show yeah. or not. What do you think, Mike? You're not going to be here. You don't care. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you do you. Unbreakable Mike Givens, final show of 2018. And it is a big one. We're going to talk some NHL. Another coach firing in the NHL. Plus uh, Alex Ovechkin. He's having himself a season. Also, going to be joined by a couple cross-country skiers as the countdown to the Canada Winter Games in Red Deer begins. Claire Littlefair and Jack Panay join us on the show. Don't go away. Cabin Sports Radio starts now. The CSR Podcast. Yes, as always, Cabin Sports Radio brought to you by our good friends at Sport North, moving sport forward. Lots to talk about on today's show. Uh, Mike, it is your last show of 2018. Yeah. Let's make it a good one. Okay. When are you heading out of town? December 28th. December 28th. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So sticking around for Christmas. Yes. And then out of here and uh, enjoying the new year in... Uh, in Toronto. Toronto. Yeah. You're actually in Toronto. Uh, west of Toronto. West of Toronto. We will see. We we have Raptors tickets secured oh, very for nice. New Year's Day. Um, uh, and then we'll see if we get some Leaf tickets as well. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. Spare so. no expense. <laughs> <laughs> well, you pretty much have to spare oh, no expense. Yeah, uh, speaking of of Leaf tickets, we're we're not we're going to try and avoid talking Leafs today. Yes, um, please. The Toronto media would have you believe that there's all, all kinds every of day to talk about some sports story. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna focus on uh, what's going on in, in the NHL at large, which is another coach firing. Five this year so far this year. Uh-huh. Dave Haxtell of the Philadelphia Flyers uh, was uh, relieved of his duties, his head coaching duties, this past Saturday, and uh, replaced by Joel Kenville, which is interesting because we were talking about when uh, Todd McClellan, of course, got fired from as head coach of the Oilers this year, was uh, replaced by by um, Ken by Ken Hitchcock, mm. and we were kind of wondering why why not Joel Kenville. Yeah, you know, there was kind of a thought. Oh, maybe he's, uh, you know, maybe he's going to take the year off. You know, obviously he's got he's got a full a full year of payment that he could just sit on. You know, go on vacation, enjoy himself, and then decide you know what he wants to do from there. But uh, nope, Joel Canville right back behind the bench uh, as the new coach of the Philadelphia Flyers. You get the sense that some of these older guys are probably just itching at another another chance to get back behind a bench. Uh, we saw that as you mentioned with with Hitchcock. Apparently, didn't take long for him at all to even consider the offer to get back behind the bench and, and coach the uh, Oilers after coaching the, the Stars up until uh, the end of last season in mm-hmm. April. So uh, guys of, of, of that caliber, uh, Quenville, Hitchcock, they their reputation precedes himself. Yeah. Um, they, they, they're they well-respected coaches in the National Hockey League. Uh, so you figure they're not going to be out of work for, for too, too long. And this was a team that was was trending in the wrong direction, to put, yes. it, to put it very lightly. Despite uh, a lot of young talent, mm-hmm. you look at the Philadelphia Flyers, and I mean that's that's obviously where this this move comes from. Dave Haxtell was uh, was brought on in 2015, and uh, the Flyers have not been good no. since then. And they've got a ton of young talent, and they're only getting younger and only more talented. Right. And you got to wonder. I mean, it, it's got goaltending is without question. Right. It's just been the perennial problem. It's a revolving in Philadelphia. door. Pretty uh, much uh, since, like, Ron Hextall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's always been their issue. The recently fired general manager. <laughs> yes. um, it's been a revolving door of goaltenders going through that franchise. Like you said, Wayne Simmons, go to spare. Uh, Claude Giroux, and then bringing in even veteran guys like James Van Riems, like over the, over the offseason, but not addressing that critical need of who's standing in between the pipes for you every night. Uh, yeah. And they just... They haven't addressed that at all, even in the off season, uh, and we're seeing it right at the bottom of the league in terms of plus minus a really hideous minus twenty three. Yes, they have lost four in a row. Uh, winners in only three of their past ten, 
and they're getting blown out of the water. Yeah. Like by by teams that they should probably be hanging with a little bit more. Vancouver five one over yeah. the weekend. The Jets, who you expect to steamroll some teams, beat them seven one last weekend. Yes. Uh, I think they've allowed at least four goals in their la- during that stretch. Uh, so the writing was on the wall mm-hmm. for some time. This is a team that is is not trending in the right direction. Um, so they say goodbye to their general manager just two weeks ago. Yep. And now it's their head coach who was also shown the door. So, uh, hey, you hope, uh, like they have in Edmonton, they seem to have turned things around right. under Hitchcock. If this mm-hmm. is the, the boost they need, uh, get a veteran voice behind the bench. And and turn turn that ship around. Right, uh, you're you're hoping that's the case if you're a Flyers fan. And as you mentioned, I mean, like some really some really demoralizing losses. Like mm-hmm. it's it's one thing to be a young team and you know being in that kind of phase where you're you're learning how to win games. Yes. Um, the Philadelphia Flyers, you could argue, are in that phase. They've got overall a pretty young roster, but they do have, like you mentioned, some pretty marquee names as far as veteran guys mm-hmm. who should be steering this thing in a much better direction that it's headed right now. But, uh, you know, that that not being the case, generally the head coach, uh, that is the first uh, the first one you look at for a change to be made. Yes. And you, you general managers will typically get two coaches, and then you start looking at, at the structure of the team a little right. bit more. Uh, and, and it was, it would have been Hextall's call not to address that very obvious goaltending need mm-hmm. in the off season when he signed James Van Riems, like other other forwards. Um, so not addressing that 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 critical need. You'll see them typically get two coaches, and then they'll, uh, you know, and and that's I think that's what 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 it came down to for um, for Dave Haxtell. The talent you think is on the ice, if it's a voice in the locker room kind of thing, he mm-hmm. just wasn't getting that level of production you would expect from that roster. Right. So. Uh, if you can get that from another coach, maybe it was a, a coaching issue. If the the issue is is much larger and more of a structural thing, that's when you you take a look at the GM, and they've they've done that already this yeah. year too. So <laughs> so they're kind of running out of options they got for a lot who to of blame. Problems. A lot of problems in <laughs> Philly apparently. Now uh, you, you got to think with a guy, especially an experienced guy, a guy who's had a lot of success even in recent years like Joel Kenville. If things don't turn around. There's nowhere really to look but the leadership group yeah, at that point exactly. and what you've got on the ice. Obviously, some glaring holes that need to be fixed before this team can uh, really become uh, successful and mm-hmm. a contender again. But you got uh, a pretty secure situation behind the bench yes. now with Joel Canville. Interesting, though, in the NHL this year. So this is the fifth head coach firing of the season. Zero head coach firings mm-hmm. all last season. Uh, this year, Todd McClellan, of course, of the Edmonton Oilers, the most recent one to be let go. John Stevens, a little bit earlier in the season, let go from the L.A. Kings. Joel Canville, just earlier in the season, was yeah. let go from the Chicago Blackhawks. And Mike Yo of the St. Louis Blues, mm. relieved of his head coaching duties also. Only one of those teams has kind of turned things around. Yeah, well, I, I was going to say, just from that list that you just mentioned, they are all bottom dwellers. Yes. Uh, L.A., last place, very last place in the entire NHL, what, 25 points on the season. Uh, the Flyers sitting dead last in the Metropolitan. Uh, St. Louis, really, really poor year. And then look yeah. at the Blackhawks. They've just had a rough go right from the get-go. Edmonton, they I, it, it seems from a timing perspective, they made that move at the right time. Yeah. Uh, if they're able to salvage their season, they're certainly on the right track. Uh, the first 12 or so games into uh, Hitchcock's um, uh, place behind the bench. That was a good time to make the play, apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, if they're able to salvage that, kudos to them. But the, yeah, the other ones, you, you almost had to make a decision at that point yeah. because those those teams were were heading in the wrong direction right out of the gate. Yeah. Um, and we should have seen this coming, I guess, with the Flyers. Uh, they have not been great either. No, and about the the same kind of timing as uh, as as Mike Yo and Todd McClellan, mm-hmm. uh, as far as when they came in, and you know that kind of. That kind of, uh, that the, the, the amount of rope you give them. You get a grace period. Basically, yeah. yes. And so so we're kind of wondering, like, should we have seen this coming this year? You know, with zero head coach firings last year, it could just be a matter of timing that mm-hmm. that's the way the contracts worked out, that it didn't make sense to necessarily fire uh, guys with two seasons left, regardless of how much the, of how much the team was struggling. Mm-hmm. So probably, yeah, maybe should have anticipated a little more harsh action from uh, from the head coaching standpoint this year. Yeah, 
and um, Mr. Quenville will get a pretty tall task quick, too. Uh, Predators coming up later this week, and then uh, next week, a date with the Lightning. Uh, and some divisional matchups in there, too. they got the Blue Jackets coming up, the Rangers. So a pretty tall order, um, but we'll get a pretty indi- good indication real quick if, if this team can turn things around and start heading in the right direction. Right. So, I mean, what we kind of got to wonder now is, could there be more? Yeah. Could there be yeah. more head coaches Certainly. with their jobs on the line? Um, ones you just kind of look at immediately from what I just mentioned, the, the timing perspective. Two guys who were brought on in uh, 2015 with their respective clubs and their clubs not looking so hot mm. are uh, Jeff Blazil, who, of course, replaced Mike Babcock as the head coach of the Detroit Red Wings after years as the assistant, an assistant coach, and uh, and head coach of the Grand Rapids Griffiths, their uh, AHL affiliate. Um, the Red Wings are not, they're not a good team. I don't know if they were necessarily expected to turn anything around mm. this year. So it's 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 tough to kind of look at a guy like Jeff Blashill and say, uh, yeah, he's the problem. Yeah, I, I would say that's that's a pretty tough call in a very top-heavy Atlantic division. You knew the Lightning, the Leafs, the Bruins would probably be there. That's that's a pretty tough division. The Canadians have been pretty good, and then you got the nice story in the in the Buffalo Sabers. I don't think I had them there at the start of the season. No, I would think another a, a lot of people probably wouldn't either. Right. Um, and then, and then, yeah, same same case in uh, New Jersey. Not much, not much at all ahead of the Flyers in the in the Metropolitan. So, yeah, that uh, that position could be in jeopardy too. Yeah, as far as as far as Blas Hill's situation, I got to think that unless it, you know, as long as the Detroit Red Wings can kind of can kind of hang around the five hundred mark, mm-hmm. he's I I would think his job is is probably kind of secure because again i I don't know what you necessarily expected from the detroit red wings coming into this year they're typically a club that doesn't make a big splash in the off season you might see you might uh, on on an off year or so you know every every few seasons you might see them try to uh to make a play for a big free agent but generally not detroit style they've always been built from within yeah um but it's just not the the within the system has just not been there to no. support a a competitive NHL club in the past few years, and you know, I, I, I it's certainly not something you can blame on a guy like Jeff Blasio. He's probably doing as good as you could expect mm-hmm. with the the depth of the roster that he's got to work with. But at the same time, um, you never know. Like maybe they think uh, maybe they think there's someone that they've got who can uh, potentially squeeze blood from a stone. Now, they, yep. They've got young talent, like good young talent in Detroit too. They just don't have a lot of marquee talent right. at this point. Not the not the sexiest market, as you said either. So you're not going to get too many of those those free agent halls. They are playing 500 hockey, give or take 14, 15, and five. You don't like that plus minus of minus 17. Uh, but what we've sort of seen, what, what the question we were asking ourselves with uh, Vancouver, with the Sedins, mm-hmm. uh, with the Sedins uh, retiring, who's gonna who's gonna carry the torch now? They've had some big names go through that franchise and yes. the not not so distant past. Uh, you know the Eisenman, Zetterbergs, Datsuks, right. and they haven't really had anyone to sort of carry on that torch per se. No, um, so. I don't think a lot of people really expected them to be in the mix, but like you said, they're playing respectable 500 hockey. Yeah, um, and who knows? Could maybe be in contention for a wild card spot, but realistically, not going to happen in a, a pretty top heavy Atlantic. It's just, it's just still strange to see Detroit as a struggling franchise after yeah. the pretty much our entire lives before. This. I want to say 22 years. I think it was 22 <laughs> yeah. consecutive years of making the postseason. And being like perennial cup contenders, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's weird not to see them in the picture. It is. It's very strange. Uh, moving, you mentioned New Jersey. Uh, John Hines, head coach of the New Jersey Devils, similar situation to Jeff Blasio was brought in in 2015 mm. to be the head coach. Uh, a bit of struggles, although the New Jersey Devils did make the playoffs last year in a season where, again, I don't know that you necessarily expected that of them coming in, but they were there. And now they're probably not going to be back. No. I don't think anyone could have predicted the rise of, of Taylor Hall, who really flourished in that that leadership role, uh, taking away a Hart Trophy. Now, at, yeah, at Hart the, Trophy winning right, Taylor Hall. At the end of it. And they were a really nice surprise mm-hmm. in the in the playoffs, too, and, and had a good run. Uh, yeah, so so pretty disappointing to see them at 11, 13, and 7, 29 points. Well, well back in the hunt. Um, behind the Capitals, Blue Jackets, Penguins, in, in, in a tough Metro as well. Um, so no, they put themselves behind the eight ball. You'd think 
differential minus 17. That's that's not looking so good. Yeah. Two wins in their last 10 games will do yeah. that too. So is he on the hot seat? You might think so. Yeah. That If I was to, to take a bet as to yeah. who I would think, if there's any head coach right now that, uh, that, that may be replaced come next season, he would probably be my bet. Um, don't think it's going to be any kind of like in the next few weeks or something. I I, I have a feeling they they let this season play out, see how it goes, mm-hmm. and then potentially make a, a a change in the off season. Uh, the only other one we could think of is uh, you know you you look down the list of current head coaches when they came in, what kind of contracts they're currently on. There's only like one or two others that really you could think realistically maybe there's there's a chance that they get looked at to be replaced. And the only one I could see is uh, potentially Bruce Boudreaux yeah. in Minnesota. And that basically only being in the event that Minnesota doesn't make the playoffs. They're in pretty tight right now mm-hmm. in the Central Division. Really could go either way. And they're another, they're another team that they have a lot of depth. They have some marquee talent, but... Not necessarily those guys that that are going to put you over the edge. They are, they're an absolute, uh, an absolute team team, mm. uh, for lack of a better way to express it. But they get it done uh, by committee rather than one or two or three players really driving the bus. Right, and 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 you mentioned some of those talent: uh, Parise, Koivu, uh, Devin Dubnik, Eric Stahl. Matt, Matt, they they have the pieces in place. A lot of names from from days gone by, mm-hmm. um, so not getting that same level of production uh, we're expected to, or, or you, you would have liked to seen uh, coming out the start of the season. Uh, but they're another team that that's just it's in a tough division. Yeah, uh, we knew the Jets would be good. We knew the Predators would be good, despite mm-hmm. uh, and they've turned it around of late. Winners of three straight. Uh, they they've had a, a fair share of injuries. Yes. Um, so you, you know they're going to turn around. They're going to be right in the mix. And then you've got the nice Avalanche story. Uh, yeah, and they they're they're looking pretty solid too. It's an uphill battle uh, for the Wild, for sure. Uh, they have the pieces, um, but they could be on the outside looking in. Yeah, um, in a, in a pretty tough Central Division. Yeah, maybe a maybe a crossover situation yeah. down the stretch, but uh, but yeah, the, either way, they're they're going to be in tough. Mm-hmm. And then you got a fun Pacific actually too. So one of those teams could easily bump them out too in the wild card picture. So uh, there we go. We've had enough of uh, speculating as to what coaches might lose their job mm. and their <laughs> their personal income. Yeah, it's also public. <laughs> it's also public. They must love that yeah. part of the job. Cabin Sports Radio. Welcome back to Cabin Sports Radio. We are on the road to the Canada Winter Games here on Cabin Sports Radio. We are counting down the days to February 15th in Red Deer. We got a couple cross country skiing athletes joining us on the show for the first time. We've got Claire Littlefair from Yellowknife and Jack Panayi, both from Yellowknife. How are you guys doing today? Good. Yeah, I'm doing pretty well too. Right on. So glad you could come in. Cross country skiing taking place in uh, the second week of the Canada Winter Games, February 25th. I want to ask you both first, uh, Claire? Is this your is this your first games? This is my second games. Your second games. Okay, so you got a little bit of uh, experience under the belt. Your second Canada Winter Games? Second Canada Winter Games. Okay. So what? Uh, with a little bit of experience, how was your, your first Canada Winter Games? My first one was pretty good. It was quite a learning curve. I was quite young, I feel like, compared to majority of the really competitive athletes, but it's always fun to go out and race and see how it goes. So did you learn a lot in your first year, I imagine? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what are you looking forward to, and what are you expecting now in, going into your second games? I'm the top of the age group now, so I feel that I'm much more competitive. And I have been doing a lot more hours of training, so I think that it'll be a good fight, so to say, for this game's. Do you know much about the class you're going to be competing against? I have a rough idea of people that I've been up against at the races throughout the season that I can assume will be around at Canada Games, too. But you never know till you get there. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Jack, how about you? Is this your first Canada Winter Games? Uh, no, Claire and I were teammates together at um, at the last games in Prince George. Okay. And what did you learn in your first games that you're looking to take forward to this year? 
Um, well, my first games, I was 14, and the category was 23 and under. So um, <laughs> I think uh, those games for me were, like Claire said, um, just a really different experience. Um, I did, like, longer races than I'd ever done before since the category was, like, so much older than I was. Mm-hmm. And um, I got to race against, like, some people who are just a whole lot better than me because they are like, so much older. Um and I got to race at a new venue, and just new experience is always good. Um, always learn a lot from every race, but I think those in particular um, I learned a lot from because uh, I was, like, so much younger than a lot of my competitors. Right. So going into to that, what was your what was your mindset like? Were you just kind of, I'm just going to come in and kind of see what happens? Because I can't imagine at age 14, like you say, in an in a age group of 23 and under, you probably didn't expect a whole lot as far as success wise no i i didn't have too high of hopes uh like result wise but uh i pretty much knew that it was going to be a super fun trip and um pretty much just went to go and learn as much as i could and do the best i could and uh i i had some good races but obviously not very impressive results so heading into uh to your second year what are you looking forward to this year uh, this year, um, I'm 18 and the category has changed to, um, mostly 19 and under. So, um, this year, like Claire said, uh, we'll both be a lot more competitive, um, and just looking to, to race the best I can. Been putting in lots of hours, um, on skis. Um, I'm happy with the way preparation's been going so far this season and, uh, yeah, just super excited to race at a new venue. Uh, Claire... So you're in the second leg of the games this year. You're starting, I believe it's February 25th is when the cross-country skiing gets underway. Uh, do you prefer being in the second leg? Is it fun to see you know, some other athletes compete in their sports before heading into yours? Does it get you fired up or does it build up the nerves? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, technically reading week is the first week, so that would have been nice to not miss a week of school. But <laughs> I think having it second week... It kind of gets like, you get more of a chance to get excited and all like ready to go because you've seen everybody else compete and you've seen it all over social media. But Yeah, but uh, so it gets you pretty excited to go. I'd say so. Right on. Jack, uh, same question to you. Does it, uh, does it make a difference to you or do you kind of like to kind of see what, every, what everyone else is doing, how everyone, everyone else is doing before you compete in your sport? Does it kind of get you into the games ahead of time? Uh, yeah, totally. Like Claire said, um, it's it's super fun to watch it all on social media. Like, see my friends who are going from different sports. Um, see, like, watch the opening ceremonies and stuff, which uh, we don't get to be a part of. But like, we just know that we'll get to do the closing ceremonies, and like, we're soon after. And then, um, just like watching watching them compete in their sports as we like rest and prepare. Um, it's pretty. It's pretty fun. And I wanted to ask both of you, uh, Claire, we'll start with you. How did you get into cross-country skiing? And uh, when did you realize this was something that you wanted to take to the next level beyond just recreation and actually take part in competitions? Uh, I would say I started with kind of like a family outing activity. And then by grade six, when I competed in my first Arctic Winter Games, then I was like, oh, I like this, so I'll keep going. And then... Uh, I, yeah, I was competitive since grade six, really, and I decided I don't want to stop yet, so I keep on competing. Did it take the, the, the competition to kind of realize that you had a knack for it, or did you always kind of, uh, think you were pretty good at it? Uh, at the time when I started, I was kind of going between competitive swimming and competitive skiing, so I think eventually it did... Like, my results were good, and I was feeling good, and it was what I was enjoying. Was that how I picked skiing? Okay. And Jack, same question. How did you get into cross-country skiing? Uh, my parents just took me out skiing um, ever since I was pretty little with the strap-on skis over top of the, um, over my winter boots, um, and then just put me in lessons when I was, like, five, I think, and then just continued, like, through the Jackrabbits program, at the LNF Ski Club, um, and then on to Track Attack, which is, like, for middle schoolers. And then, uh, like, by that age, I think they go on, like, a couple competitions um, in Alberta and stuff. And, like, 
racing, just local Yellowknife races, uh, all super fun. And going to my first uh, Arctic Winter Games, another like super fun experience. And then um, moving on to the the high performance program here in Yellowknife, um, where we we do lots of racing um, and prepare all through the year, like for the races. Um, and I it's just something I enjoy doing. Um, I I love skiing and I love racing. So just never stopped. So we're about two months away now from the Canada Winter Games. What is the timeline? What is the schedule for you, Jack, as far as preparation two months out goes? Where do you where do you take it from here? Um, just spending t- lots of time on skis, um, doing a little bit of uh, dryland strength, and uh, just um, we. I have some races that I just came back from, and I have... Um, more races after the games but um from here until then i i'm not racing at all so it's just all um all training um and then uh yeah just put in lots and lots of hours and then pretty much for the last week um it'll be mostly rest and then be ready for the games are you taking any uh any time away for christmas or are you pretty much just going hard right through uh no we'll definitely be training right through right through the holidays okay and uh, Claire, same question. Two months away, what is the training schedule looking like for you? I think it'll be quite a bit of hours on snow, and then the intensity will ramp up, and then uh, back to lower the intensity and just some volume on snow. Do you kind of, like the week before the games, do you kind of just take that week to relax a little bit? I... I like to. I like to yeah. get out on snow because it's relaxing to just go out and ski easy. Mm-hmm. It's important to get uh, like still some hours of easy skiing in, but at that point you're not doing any strength-based stuff and you're not doing any um, hard intervals. You're not really putting in work anymore. Um, at that point you're mostly resting, but it is still important to um, be skiing lots, uh, like pr- usually like an hour a day or something for, for like the week leading up. Right. Um, as well as like some stretching and... Um, getting lots of sleep and watching your diet and stuff. Well, hopefully the weather uh, agrees with you two a little bit. Uh, two months in Yellowknife leading up, it's uh, probably not going to be the nicest weather, but you're going to have to push through, obviously. So uh, so good luck to both of you. Two months to go from the Canada Winter Games in Red Deer. Jack, Claire, thank you so much for coming in today. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. The Cabin Sports Radio Podcast, brought to you by Sport North, moving sport forward. Cabin Sports Radio brought to you by Sport North. Moving Sport Forward. For more information, check out sportnorth.com. And for those who have not been paying attention, the great eight, Alex Ovechkin, is having himself a season. A season to be remembered. I mean, we we always generally, since uh, Alex Ovechkin broke into the NHL in the 06 season, we generally expect him to be among the top uh, goal-scoring leaders. And, uh, well, he's there again. He is sitting at the top, currently with 29 goals in 32 games. Seemingly out of nowhere, too. We had that that game that Patrick Laine had five goals not too long ago to put him in the lead. I think that gave him 21 goals at the time. Since, Ovechkin has now built a rather comfortable cushion of five goals over uh, Jeff Skinner, uh, Buffalo's Jeff Skinner in second place, uh, 34 games played. Ovechkin's played two games less. And somehow has 29 goals and has himself a five goal cushion atop the NHL scoring. Yeah, I'm not sure how you go about quietly putting together a 29 just, goal in 32 game season so far. But I guess we just, again, we just expect it so much of Alex Ovechkin by this time that it's like, oh, he's he's nearly on a goal a game pace. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah, that that's Ovi. We take his greatness for, for granted. We, we totally do. We do. We absolutely do. Uh, so on pace for 74 goals, which <laughs> probably isn't sustainable um but we are talking about arguably one of the greatest goal scorers ever yes uh certainly the best goal scorer of his generation and it's not even close no um we were blessed with two generational talents in in him and Sidney crosby uh but that total would give us one of the highest goal totals in quite some time yeah 92 93 uh when we saw 76 goals scored by alexander mcgillney uh 
And Timu Solani. Yeah. Yeah. Tied for the goal scoring lead way back then. Uh, both it well actually Timu Solani was a rookie. I think it was McGilney's uh, second season mm-hmm. in the league. But nevertheless, finishing both with a ridiculous seventy six goals. Yeah, we haven't seen anything really close to that. No. Uh, since the closest I believe we've seen, well at least in the modern era, was uh, a few years ago when uh, Steven Stamkos won the Maurice Richard Trophy with a sixty goal season. Mm-hmm. We haven't even seen one of those since. It's been quite a while. Um, so. <laughs> If Alex Ovechkin could keep up this pace yeah. and finish with seven, even if he finishes with seventy goals or yeah. sixty above, it's going to be an unreal season. And uh, you would have to think the runaway winner for his eighth Maurice that, Rocket Richard Trophy. So that trophy was introduced in in ninety nine. Um, he he's won seven. He he's on pace to win his eighth. In that time, no one has won more than two. No one else. No. Uh, I believe Stamkos. Uh, Pavel Bure, uh, Sidney Crosby, and there's one other name. And uh, Jerome McGinley. Jerome McGinley. Yeah. Have, I believe, two, two apiece. Yes. None of them have more than two. And Ovechkin could potentially win an eighth. It's unfathomable. It really is. It, and this would, it would put him past, I believe, Hall for the most scoring titles. I believe he has seven. It's, it's so, it's so unreal to the point, like, where you say we, 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 absolutely take Alex Ovechkin and his scoring prowess for granted. It's just so so common now mm-hmm. that, ah, yeah, Alex Ovechkin's going to lead the league in goals. He's probably going to score 50 again. A feat that, like, doesn't even happen at all. Didn't happen last year. It didn't. He led the league in scoring with a total of 49 yeah. for his seventh Maurice Rocket Richard yeah. trophy. Um, and But he is on pace, to, unless he suddenly just falls way off the pace, which, I mean, he just scores so regularly. Mm-hmm. You can't even call... He's not even one of these guys you could call a streaky scorer. No. You know, he just he just regularly puts the puck in the net and just seems to be getting better with age. Mm-hmm. He's 33 years old, and he's having his best career... He's having his best career season goal-scoring-wise. And that's a conversation that sort of started prior to their, their Stanley Cup run... Um, last spring, which absolutely 100% solidified his legacy as one of the greatest hockey players ever. Uh, certainly one of the best scorers ever. And that's all he really needed. He needed that that team accomplishment, and he got right. it. But that sort of was the talking point. When is he going to slow down? Because he's still putting up these numbers with seeming ease, Yeah, it, it, it feels like. And he's got himself right atop once again. Uh, it's you really do start to take advantage of it, uh, or sorry, um, uh, you forget how good he is on a regular basis. Yeah, and 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 it's so this. I remember this was put forward last year. Uh, someone wrote an article saying, "Is it possible that Alex Ovechkin could break Wayne Gretzky's mm. all-time goal-scoring record?" And just as a hot take thought on it, I was like. Ridiculous. Yeah. No, nobody could ever touch one of Gretzky's records because he just put up points like nobody's business. And I mean, nobody will ever touch his points record. No, never. that is you no. Know, nobody's almost two thousands assists. That is <laughs> assists insane. alone. That's crazy. It's unbelievable. Yeah, like the, y- y- do yourself a favor yeah. and actually look at look up Wayne Gretzky. Google Wayne Gretzky's career statistics, yeah. and it's it's interesting how a guy who scored ninety two goals. One year, the record for single season uh, goal scoring total ninety two goals. He scored fifty goals in not only fifty games, mm. thirty nine games. And you look down season by season at his point totals, and yeah. at some point in kind of the mid nineties, the goal scoring really drops off. Yeah, and he started Gretzky started to struggle to even really hit twenty goals. Yeah, which was strange at the time, but I mean, you know, natural natural progression with age he was starting to get up there the game was starting to get faster uh players were starting to get bigger and stronger and faster at the same time and you know this was not in the age this was still in the age of of hooking and holding yeah and that was all fine um but you look at the assists and he still put up like 50 plus assists per season like uh, the kind of numbers that uh, Sidney Crosby on a good year, right? You know, puts up yeah. fifty plus. Gretzky on an off year was putting up fifty plus assists. But nevertheless, we don't need to talk about assists. We want to talk about yeah. putting the puck in the net. And from that standpoint, 
if you look at the pace that Alex Ovechkin is on career-wise, you put a few more 50-goal seasons up. Mm -hmm. Like we say, he may put 70 up this year. You put a few more 50-goal seasons after that. He right now stands at 636 career goals. Gretzky's record is 894. Alex Ovechkin is 33 years old. Mm -hmm. You could reasonably assume with the way he's playing right now, unless, you know, pending some unforeseen, uh, unfortunate injury, uh, God forbid that happened to him, um, or just, you know, suddenly maybe having a change of heart and deciding he doesn't want to go for Gretzky's record, which I can't see because the guy just seems to love the game. Exactly. To that point, though, he doesn't get injured. No. He's missed a career 28 games over a 13-year career, which is insane to think about. Don Cherry probably doesn't like hearing that. He loves going on about <laughs> you know Canadian durability and, and European players tend to be more soft. Alex that's, Ovechkin is a mold. That's breaker. not that's that's not a lot of time to miss over a thirteen year career. No, that's pretty impressive. He doesn't get injured. No, so it does sort of beg the question. And when he is scoring at a fifty goal clip, which he's done on mm-hmm. numerous occasions, has a real chance at, at getting a, an eighth uh, Rocket Richard Trophy. It's not that crazy of a conversation to have or a question to pose. He's been asked it recently um, and shot it down as impossible, mm. but then scored. Did he score consecutive hat tricks this past week? He scored seven goals in three games this past week, um, as if to, to make a point. I I always looked at, at, at Gretzky's all time records as insurmountable yeah. uh, compared to other North American professional sports. Right. Uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar's. 38,000 some odd points in the NBA. Uh, barring anything catastrophic, LeBron James uh, is on pace. Mm. He, that's, a, that's a record he could shatter. And he said that he believes Kevin Durant could then shatter that record. So I've always looked at that as a record that, that could be top. Kind of the equivalent. Yeah. yeah. Um, when it comes to Gretzky, the, I don't think that's the case at all. And, and no. like you said, certainly points. I was just looking. He had more career assists. Yes. 42 more career assists then Yeremy Yager had points, and he's second in the all-time NHL scoring list. Yeah, so that is completely untouchable. There's yeah. no question. It will never. It will never happen. No. The goals, though, that's where it gets a little bit more interesting. Yeah, he's not. He he was five years younger. Um, uh, Gretzky was when he hit the 600 goal mark compared right. to Ovechkin. Um, and and time. Maybe running out on him, right. uh, but but thirty three years old, no history of health issues. We no. saw we saw Yager, who's who's pretty high up on that list, number two, play well into his forties. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you like you said, the guy loves to play hockey. Yeah, he loves he loves to score goals. I, I can't think of anyone who loves to score goals more than Alexander Ovechkin. Um, you know he's always going to get top power play minutes. That's another record he's actually creeping up on. I believe he's thirty nine goals. I think it's Dave Andrew Chuck. Mm. Um, for the all-time power play goals, Mark. Okay. You know where his office is. Yep. On the left-hand side, in the circle. And nobody stops and that no one time. And no one And they know that's his office, yep. and it's still unstoppable. And they still can't stop yeah. it. So it's 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 not that crazy of a question to ask. Um, you hope there are no health issues. There haven't been so far. I, I think I think I, I look at the, the Gordy Howe. Uh, I believe he's got 801 goals. That, that mm. m- Maybe that's a little more attainable. Right. Um. But he's showing, uh, Ovechkin's showing no signs, no serious signs anyways of slowing down. So it's not that crazy to think about. It's it's mind-blowing how achievable it is, honestly. And for a guy who, like you say, you talk about his, uh, his, his durability over the course of his season, uh, missed 28 games, a total of 28 games mm-hmm. in his 13 seasons so far. Most guys would kill for that kind mm-hmm. of durability. You add to that the fact that Washington just came off a Stanley Cup winning run. Yeah. So not a lot of time in the off season to, you know, rest the body, relax, recover. We always like to make jokes that it seems like any any given time, any year when the Pittsburgh Penguins win a Stanley Cup, they seem to kind of take the first month of the next season right, off. Right. And then they they're like, "Oh, okay, yeah, no, we're the best team in the league." And they just start winning games again because they're Sidney Crosby mm-hmm. and Kenny Malkin and the Pittsburgh Penguins, and that's just what they do. They yeah. just know how to win hockey games. But it always seems like that first month or so, they just they don't look like they're really mm-hmm. they're really in game shape yet. 
Alex Ovechkin and the Washington Capitals, as we just mentioned, has just come off a Stanley Cup winning season, won the Conn Smythe Trophy, was unquestionably the Washington Capitals' best player, and won the MVP of the playoffs mm-hmm. as a result. And now he comes back into the following season and is on the best goal-scoring pace of his career. It it defies logic. Mm-hmm. At 33 years old, this guy who just does not get injured continues. Yeah. It's like he could just play 12 months of the year and be fine yeah. and just keep going. And don't look now. Uh, won five in a row. Eight of their past ten. Uh, a six-point lead on the Metropolitan Division. And they believe they can make another deep run. They're... We- they're playing really good hockey right now. They they've got a we know they got the goaltending. They've got the defensive core and they've got the best scorer of their generation, maybe certainly in the top couple all time. And uh they're poised to make another run, at least that's the early indicator. We were coming into this break debating or at least kind of posing the debate is Alex Ovechkin the greatest pure goal scorer of all time? And you know, after having this conversation, <laughs> I don't even know if it's a question. Mm. He is. How can you not call him the greatest pure goal scorer? Failing actually breaking Wayne Gretzky's record. You just look at the body of work of Alex Ovechkin in the modern era with what you've got to compete against. How can you not call him the greatest pure goal scorer of all time? Mm -hmm. So I'm not even going to put up a question. You can just send us a message if you want. Tell us why we're wrong. And we will be back on Cabin Sports Radio. The CSR Podcast. Cabin Sports Radio brought to you by Sport North. One more segment before Mike Gibbons takes off. Back home for Christmas. We won't see you again until the new year. Yeah. Enjoy, my friend. January 8th? January 8th. the next one? Yes, I believe so. Yeah, that's right. So you're going to a Raptors game? Yes. Any other big plans? Not that I know of just yet. Uh, That will be on on New Year's Day. They take on the Utah Jazz, so we got some tickets to that one. Um and we'll see if uh, maybe a Leaf game in there as well. I know. Uh, sneak one in yeah, there. Yeah, they play the Islanders on the, the 29th. That'd be a good one. To Johnny see. T's first game yeah. against his former squad. It won't have the same meaning because it's in Toronto. Right. But uh, maybe you, a bit of nastiness there. Yeah, Who knows? You figure the Islanders will, will get up for that one, face their former captain, but uh, I'll keep you posted. That could be a fun one. Yeah. All right, man. Well, you enjoy your vacation, and uh, we will. Uh, well, we'll get ready for some World Junior hockey right. in the meantime. Very good. Also, I uh, want to give a plug to uh, Kids Sport. Give the Gift of Sport 2018. Fundraising goal is $150,000. All money donated goes to Kids Sport. NWT stays in the territory. To donate or for more info, go to kidsport.ca slash gift of sport.